Hello, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm so thrilled to be here today and so excited for this virtual event with all creatures great and small. Please join me in welcoming today's guests who have helped bring James Harriet's story to the screen. We have the actor who plays James Harriet's, Nicholas Ralph. Hello. The actor, <laughs> the actor who plays Siegfried Farnan, Samuel West. Hello. The actor who plays Helen Harriet. Please welcome Rachel Shenton. Hello. The actor who plays Tristan Farnan, Callum Woodhouse. Hello. And the actor who plays Mrs. Hall, Anna Maidley. Hello. And we also have the executive producer of Playground, Melissa Gallant. Hello. And the executive producer of Masterpiece, Suzanne Simpson. Hello. Again, congratulations on a wonderful third season. Somehow this show just keeps getting better and better. Um, it's also that rare program that is loved both by critics and by audiences and just something really special. Um, I would just love to know why you think this show resonates so much with people, especially right now. And let's start with Suzanne. Well, just this afternoon, for example, I was out for a walk and ran into neighbors who had had dinner with people the night before, and they're telling me they love the show. And so I ask, well, why, why do you like it so much? And they say, it, it's just so warm, inspiring, uplifting, funny. They just enjoy all of the characters. So they like to see what happens to all of them. So I think it just is that feeling of a warm bath that, you know, everybody just enjoys. I love that metaphor, warm bath. Now I want to take one. Um, <laughs> Melissa, what about for you? I just think our news feeds are so full of stories about people trying to destroy each other and nations. And I just think the show brings something that really flies in the face of that about a family uh, and a community who support and care about each other. Um, and it's, it's, it's joyful and it's funny, but it also, we don't shy away from the truth of those characters and relationships and stories and sometimes um, how painful that is. Um, but, but we always bring audiences back to a place of, of sort of warmth and warmth and humor as well. I think we are just so inundated with, wonderful letters and emails from people who often are actually having a really difficult time and find watching the show it's almost medicinal I think just makes them feel better and people are so passionate about the show and the characters I, I'm curious for the cast um if you get recognized for the show and I'm sure you do what what do people mostly want to talk to you about and let's start with Callum, because I really think your brother should have told you that you didn't pass the exam. <laughs> I would have a word. With yeah, I mean, I mean, that, that that's a big one. It's also um, will, will Tristan and Siegfried ever ever hug? That's another that's another big one that people are desperate to talk about. <laughs> well, let's yeah, answer that right now. Know, <laughs> me and Sam, me and Sam hug all the time. All if, the time. If, that, if that's any yeah, sure consolation. Really, yeah. <laughs> it is, what, it what's is. so cool about about that as well is that it's not even in the UK now. I mean, we were out in LA there and we got stopped at, um, at a food market. And Rach, yeah. didn't you get stopped somewhere in Eastern Europe or something? Yeah, I was shooting in uh, Slovakia in Bratislava earlier this year, and I, I got I got recognised for all creatures, which was very nice. That is sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm apparently you know, much better dubbed into like... Turkish. <laughs> 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 good to know. I would like to see the Turkish dub. Mm, very good. No, the Turkish good one. Dub is. I've heard it. I, I sound like I've smoked 40 pack a day for about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> You've only been on 20 a day as well. <laughs> <laughs> Work up to it. I mostly get recognized in the school run, but I think the people I um <laughs> that I've spoken to kind of they love that they can all watch it together I've, I've got yeah. you know people I know watch it with their little kids with their teenagers I think you know I come on Melissa said it's like there is something in there for everybody there are strong issues you can have a good conversation about but you can also have a lot of fun all of those things I have you know I just think anyone in any household can sit down and enjoy it together and I think that's one of the real treats yeah because um, it's about um, it that I keep hearing from people 
Yeah, the center of it is like relationships, whether that's family, mm. romantic, friendship, or work. And I yeah. mean, stories so like that are never going to go out of fashion. To do things in our own little boxes, and I think it's a it's a show that is. I mean, perhaps not deliberate. Looking at us all in little boxes. It puts us all in little boxes. I mean, yeah. that's not how we should be talking about it. But it, but it, but it celebrates something that we all know exists, but it's hard to put your finger on. It's invisible, but it matters to us more than perhaps anything, which is community, and and yeah. people doing decent, trying to do the decent thing. I mean, in 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 the service of animals that can't always talk. I mean, who can't always talk using using words. So we have to be empathetic and you know try and review. <laughs> I mean, some of them can talk. Eric, <laughs> <laughs> Eric never shuts up, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, but it's, 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 ba- it's, that, it's based on kindness and compassion, not only for the animals, but for one another. And, and at the heart of it is, is love as well, um, mm. which is lovely. And one of, the, one of the great things I love about it is people say, I sit down with the whole family, you know, multi-generation from grandparents down to kids. And everyone can sit in the same room and, and watch the show together. And I don't know how common that's been over the last, you know, few years or, or whatever. So I, I I take a lot of pride in that. I think that's really cool. I, love I tried to watch an episode with my eight year old and I finally got her to sit through one. And then the next week I said, that was fun last week. Do you want to see all creatures? And she said, no, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> there's, there's more we've got we've done, no, we've done more episodes said, no i've seen that now thank you <laughs> no, that's, enough. that's a great review yeah, yeah. <laughs> been there done that we didn't we didn't leave her wanting so that's encouraging exactly yeah. <laughs> uh Season three has so much joy in it, but it also has these more somber moments as the world is dealing with the onset of the war. Melissa and Suzanne, can you talk about incorporating that into season three and how you sort of decided what the arc of the season would be? Hmm. You know, that is what Melissa does so well with Ben Vanstone is the two of them really decide what the arc of the season should be. And then I'm lucky enough to get into that conversation at some point to hear what they're thinking about for the characters and really what the backdrop, you know, and the time period should be. And I think, you know, since it is such a joyful show to enter into this time of war, I think was tricky in terms of deciding how it affects these, you know, six individuals um, and their families. And so I don't know, Melissa, if you want to talk about some of the decision making that you and Ben had. Sure. I mean, with this show, the series storylines always, always start with character. That's where we always begin. So Harriet's wonderful characters brought to life by these exceptional actors. Um, and in, in season one, Ben Vanston, our lead writer and exec, um, really explored those characters in greater depth and gave them really interesting backstories. So that's where we always begin. And every season, therefore, presents an opportunity to tell the next chapter of their stories and their relationships, um, often through animal stories. And when characters are that rich and interesting, you could tell stories about them forever and a day. Um, Obviously, this season set in 1939, which is the run up to the Second World War. And we had to keep reminding ourselves that actually the characters don't know what's going to happen. It's not even, you know, 20 years since the last war. They don't know what's going to happen. But it was such an interesting, rich opportunity to see our characters having to make choices and decisions in a world under threat. And those themes of responsibility and duty, I mean, for James, He's just got married, so his responsibilities as a new husband, as a partner in the vet, surgery, as a citizen, and for all our characters, um, and also taking control of their own stories in a world they can't control. So it was such a gift, really. Um, And we wanted every year, we're hard on ourselves because we care about it, want it to be really good, and we wanted to make the best series yet. And I guess the war gave us a couple of sort of narrative windows to jump through. I'll talk about two specifically. One was um, the episode three, we flash back to World War One to tell a little bit of uh, the, the pain that Siegfried went through in that first World War and perhaps suggesting a little of how that's impacted him. Again, through an animal story, he's such a lover of horses. So that was the story Ben told that 
that narrative through. And also thinking about Mrs. Hall and her son, Edward, that episode that we all absolutely love that went out last week, I think for you. Um, it felt like a moment where a pending war and signing up for the Navy was a moment where Edward might make contact with Mrs. Hall again. So it was just so rich and full of such opportunities, but we were also really conscious that we didn't want that shadow of looming war to be too overbearing and that the experience of the show I think is what people come back for and that it should still be really really funny um and have lots of uh, Tristan being ridiculous um and should have romance and wonder and pain and all those things we love about it so it was striking that balance really and I what I loved about this season is that you start with the wedding and the wedding is such, again, a wonderful moment, you know, that James and Helen are going to come together. And of course, it has all those comedic elements of, you know, getting to the church on time. And the other thing I really enjoyed about this season is um, you had made a commitment in the beginning to bring out the women characters, and which wasn't really true of the books. They weren't very developed. And so to have the storyline with Mrs. Hall and Edward, to have Helen coming into Skeldale you know, house and all of a sudden she's in a place that isn't her home, you know, that she doesn't control. I really enjoyed those storylines too uh, for season three. I want to talk a little bit specifically about some of those episodes because I'm curious for the actors what it's like getting to play these characters over a period of time. Um, for example, Samuel, in episode three, we learned so much more about Siegfried, particularly mm. his time in the first war. Mm. Did you sort of already have that backstory coming into the show? We knew he'd had a bad experience. When yes, you read I did. Episodes, no, I did. And I, in fact, uh, from the from the very top, when Brian uh, Percival, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Brian, uh, uh, Brian, our lead director and and producer, uh, first approached me about the part, I got from Ben Vanston a, a two-page character note about Siegfried's backstory. And as I may have said before, it wasn't exactly a Chekhov short story, but it wasn't far off in terms of its detail. If, if it, fe it felt like something that was absolutely based. I could do a timeline from it. I could work out who was important, who was dead, who was dead and important. Um, and really from then on the pleasure of doing three series has been to see those things that were always in the background rise to the surface um and sometimes they were sort of seen dimly like like through tracing paper but eventually when the stories came you thought no i as i say this i realize it's true mm -hmm. and always has been there hasn't really been anything in the backstory that that has surprised me or hasn't fitted and i think that's really down to to Ben's um, preparation and also his instinct for what is dramatic, because the, the first two series, you know, people have been people have been delighted by the animals and, and charmed by the scenery, uh, and now we, we we're able to go somewhere deeper, and we find that all, all of those places we want to go, you know, the show will hold your hand because of what we've set up in terms of the characters in the first two series, and that's a real privilege as an actor because you don't often get to do things for this long. Uh, and, and when and when they continue to be fun and good as well, you know, that's a real blessing. Ben Vanston calls it treasure hunting. So reading Harriet's books, there'll often be a reference to something and he'll say, oh, hang on, that's interesting. What's the story behind that? And I think with Siegfried, he's such in the books, it's all there. It's such a, he's such a complex, wonderful character. And I think the question Ben asked is, what happened to him? Um, and, uh, and so as Sam says, sort of when you, when ben, you know Ben unpacked that backstory, it sort of makes perfect sense of what you're the character that you're presented with in the book. Well, I was recently rewatching the first episode, and I was thinking, Callum, we've we've really seen Tristan grow up in the last three seasons. I, I, did you anticipate that transformation? I mean, there's there's a moment in season three where he's cleaning the surgery room, and it's such a switch from season one. It was kind of jarring. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I think, like we always said that. Um, James coming in was such a huge um, benefit for Tristan as well, because as as well as James, I think, because we've always said they sort of balanced each other out. You know, Tristan helped <laughs> helped help James uh, go to the pub maybe, and and, and you know, <laughs> like let his hair down type of thing. And um, 
and James sort of lit that fire under, under Tristan a bit more rather than him rather than it just always being about well I'm doing this because that's what Siegfried has said I'm doing next type of thing it yeah it, I think I think James sort of makes it um more of a passion rather than a uh like a checklist of things or whatever that he has to do um but yeah his transformation yeah I certainly I certainly didn't see it coming um uh, from from the first couple of episodes I knew obviously he was he was going to grow up but not not into the sort of not into the not into the sort of guy that he has yeah by the way I know this has been pointed out before but I just have to say kudos to the casting director because Callum and Samuel you really do look like brothers yeah <laughs> that's the other that's the other thing that actually people say when we uh if, if we get stuff <laughs> it's like really believe the the brotherly relationship one of the things we had to work out was how on earth he could be because if Cal plays a little bit older and I play a little bit younger, we can just about be 19 years apart. Yeah. And series three is the one where we make sense of that gap. Yeah. It all adds up, which is really satisfying. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Anna, season three found reunion. I think we've all been waiting for between Mrs. Hall and her son, Edward. What was your reaction when you read this episode? And it, it's such an intense episode. Was it ever challenging for you to shoot it? Um. Uh, yeah, it was, I I loved it when I read it. I mean, in a way, it's sort of a lot of what Sam said in terms of, you know, Mrs. Hall isn't in the books much, but but the character that was written from the get-go had such integrity. It, it it felt like it had all been thought out. So so as that story came out, it again, it made absolute sense. It, it You didn't feel like you were having to negotiate anything it just it was I mean, it was a beautiful script I think everyone felt that on you know all the crew as well as us as actors and um and, and beautifully balanced as well I think with having Tristan at home cooking the sausages in my pinnies <laughs> <laughs> that was really lovely um uh so and it and then it was a really it was a really wonderful challenge as an actor to, to have that meeting um with the character that you know we've talked about for a long time and and I, I was really excited to meet as as an actor, and Mrs. Hall has been desperate to meet for for three more plus years. Um, so it was it was a really exciting, wonderful challenge, and, and a lot of fun to do. The, the the filming on the train station with an enormous steam train um, and a lot of pigeons was <laughs> a really fun week. It was great. So yeah, it was um, yeah, it was a real privilege to have that storyline. It was great. And and I've, I've always wanted to do a skeleton meal. Oh, sorry, go on. You talk about your mashed potatoes. And you did it beautifully. My you little pot of flowers when I got home made me so happy. Your little, your personal shepherd's pie. <laughs> My personal shepherd's pie, yeah. <laughs> Just to pick up something that Melissa said about uh, very often with with with, with Edward and, and Mrs. Hall, this was a this was a scene that could have taken place earlier, but I remember Melissa saying to me so often that Ben, ben and she were looking at at episodes and even series sometimes and saying you know what that can wait or that can be that can be later or we, or there's too much in this episode we're trying to do too much and that is such yeah. a privilege yeah. if it turns out you know the drama in episode one season one is that a cow may may give birth to a stillborn calf and that's all you need mm -hmm. if you tried to do another bit mm. of story to try and make it more dramatic it wouldn't have worked it would have burst so the pleasure of being able to put yeah. these things off and eventually you know, cash that check in the third series <clears throat> is, is really considerable, I think. And it was lovely. I felt I felt because the, the meeting with Edward in episode five felt like it came at the right time in the world. It made absolute sense that that was the moment at which that meeting that could have been put off and put off and put off then had to happen. There was there was a real urge from both of them to make that meeting happen. And and that it came from Edward was um, you know, a, a, a wonderful thing for Mrs. Hall. So yeah, again, that that thing of it being at the right time in the whole world of our of our show um, was, was fantastic. And Anna, the director kept you apart um, from the actor playing Edward, didn't he? He did. Yeah, I I texted Connor saying, "Do you want to have a beer and say hello?" Because I thought it'd just be nice to get to know him a bit. And Andy said, "No, no, no. Do you mind waiting?" Um, because because I was thinking, well, she'd known her little boy from way back when, but it was really interesting actually thinking, well, actually, she hasn't seen him. He arrives in his naval uniform. She hasn't seen this young man. Um, so it really heightened that sense of they've had this time apart 
they don't know each other they don't know who it is that's gonna they might have an idea of who this person's gonna be that they're gonna meet but um for mrs hall she's she's um she meets with a man who's a little bit well she, he's a young man now rather um than the sort of grown-up boy that she left behind so um so that was very lovely and it get and, and all the other wonderful thing andy did was he managed to schedule a lot of it in sequence so as we filmed we didn't have to film the last scene <laughs> before the beginning so so we worked all that he worked all that choreography out on the train station and then we could do it so so in a way we were able to play the emotional journey from beginning to end which was uh, uh was a real luxury as an actor you don't always get to do that that was that was really wonderful a real gift to us as actors to have that and Nicholas, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this is your first on-camera job ever when you book this series. <laughs> Going back and looking at where the character began, kind of thrust into this world with all these, you know, wonderful people. Do you relate to how far you've both come in the last three seasons? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I had, I'd been to drama school and I, I did a lot of theatre and things, but this was my first um, telly job. Um, but it was brilliant because you're just surrounded by this wonderful cast who couldn't be more, you know, helpful day to day. And, and, it, and you know, when you're working, everyone says it's like the perfect way to start out because you you the learning curve you're on is like that because you have to be. You're working on pretty much, every, I think I had two days off or something. You know, um, but it was it was amazing. And likewise, as you say, James, he's grown into himself a lot more. You know, he fills out his vet's coat a little more now. And he's now partner of the practice. And he's also a husband now. So there's a lot more pressure on him as well to a lot more responsibility, uh, a lot more pressure. Um, he's bringing in money for for two now and uh, and thinking about their future together. So. Um, he also has a responsibility to Siegfried and to the practice, you know, uh, the, the man that gave him his start in 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 life in in this part of his life. Um, so, yeah, he's he's growing up in front of our very eyes. <laughs> and speaking of characters, we keep discovering new sides of um, Rachel. Uh, so many, so many changes for this season, you know, good, good changes. Um, but I think I heard recently that you've actually been in contact with Alf White's children and they sort of helped guide your performance. Um, yeah, really lucky. I mean, we were all in, we were introduced to um, uh, Jim and Rosie White at the start of this journey at, at season one, and they were super gracious and sharing their stories and anecdotes and things with us. And then I sort of clung on to that relationship with, with Rosie. I always joke that I'm sure she's blocked. She'll block my number eventually, but um, I, I do call her every season um, to sort of tell her where Helen is in her life and what's going on. And then she usually tells me a little bit about her mom and what she either remembers or can tell me about that phase of her life as well. And it's a bit of a peek behind the curtain. So like similarly to Mrs. Hall's uh, character, really Helen, we learned about Helen in the books through James, so we we never really got to discover who she is. So I guess I've um, yeah, that's been a privilege to sort of invent that bit with the help of Rosie. Yeah, and was they it... came to the filming of the wedding as well. I don't think you want to talk about that, Rachel. I, yes, I called them up and lovely. said, yeah. "How would you like to come and attend your own parents' wedding?" And they were thrilled to come, but perhaps you want to talk about that. <laughs> that's so. Cool. Can you see them in the episode? I don't think so. No, they're sitting actually in the choir stalls watching. It was really emotional. I was sitting behind them. They were sitting together in the choir stalls quite close to um, Helen and James uh, exchanging vows. And they they were so moved and Rosie had quite a few tears. It was very emotional, I think, for them. It's amazing. Um, of course, we have to talk about the the co-stars that steal the show, which is the animals. Um, and I actually want to I want to learn how method you all are. We have a question from Isaac. He's age seven and he's from Colorado. He wants to know: Do any of the actors have pets of their own, and if so, which kind? Yes. I'm going to start that because we've got new, the newest one. We've just got two oh. white kittens. <gasps> oh wow! Oh yeah. my goodness! Oh, Bryant and Anna, Anna, Anna and Briar. Um, are uh, they there? No, no, they're not. They're kept out of this room for the moment because they destroy everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who I have a friend who said, um, you, 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 you're, you're a, a metropolitan liberal elite uh, um, fool. I said, yes. Uh, so you always have rescue cats. I said, guilty. She said, that's great, but the children never get to play with kittens. True, I said, sad, but true. Well, I've got two rescue kittens for you, she said. 
so I completely walked into it. Yeah. And I wasn't going to say no. And now we have two white kittens. Hello. Hi, Rosie. Rosie. Hello. Rosie. Hello. Rosie. 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 Hello. Rosie. Why is she going that way? Because we're talking to her. This is Rosie. Oh. Rosie. Oh. Hello, Rosie. I'll see if I can get <laughs> Rosie can sometimes be found in the makeup truck when we're shooting. I was wondering if she comes to the. I'm set. going on the move now. Um, <laughs> everyone has to show off their their oh, animals now. I started to say dogs. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm, I'm asking for my line now. <laughs> Nicholas, what about for you? Uh, no, no, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, but I get to hang out with all these guys. Ralph, I'm sure, is about to make an appearance. That's Carl's dog, and Rosie, of course. <laughs> And I can't wait to meet the kids. I think it's good because then this, the animals on the show know that you don't belong to anyone else, Nick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they can sense you available. Getting, I was responsible for getting a rat onto the show, though. That is I the, did see that. Yes, you've been yeah, trying to do that. Of my, that's because of my fondness for rats in the past. I now have children instead of rats. <laughs> um, wait, who's this? Here he is. Here we are. I'm, I'm, hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, I was like Simba. <laughs> I'm gonna to have to introduce another white a white. This is oh this is Annet. <gasps> oh hello. So, There's a white pet thing. There's a colour scheme going, going on. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I wish I had like a teddy bear or something I could hold up. I don't even have that. Yeah, this is Wilbur. He just Aww. wants to say hi. <laughs> He's a theater dog. Found him outside my theater and <laughs> said um, I was not going to keep him. That was six years ago. Yeah. No way. Oh, Still thinking about so it. Cool. <laughs> oh. Rachel and Caleb, your dogs look alike. They do look very alike, yeah. They, they, they were hooking each other la the last time that they met. They were good friends, yeah. Good friends. I admire your skill in still talking, even though you're having your nose licked. <laughs> you like that? Special skills. I learned it all on the job. <laughs> but Sam, cast going well, heard... cast animals going well. I I heard there were two rats, and that you know the difference, which is your rat and the stand in rat. Yes. Because they're, they're, they're mink hooded, so they have slightly different shaped saddles. And to non-rat fanciers, they look the same. But um, I, I'm used to looking at rats in detail, and I can tell them apart. So we have one who's slightly more sedentary, uh, and that's the one you choose if you, if you want to have a shot of them being where they need to be. And we have one that's a little bit more active, and that's the one you choose if you want to see him go, or her playing him going all around her cage. What are their names? Uh, they don't have names at the moment. I wanted um, to call them cheap and nasty, them. but they wouldn't have it. They might know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read. Perhaps, perhaps we should ask. Perhaps people yeah. should be allowed to, because obviously the, the 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 hero rat is called Volanel, which is a difficult name, um, and that's a, that's a, that's it? already taken. But neither of the rats who play Volanel have, I think, names at the moment. So Bon. Should... You should have a naming contest. Why not? Yeah. 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 Isaac yeah. from Colorado can send some suggestions. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Isaac. Young yeah. Isaac. Give us two names. <laughs> And yeah. Anna, that, unlike your character, Mrs. Hall, you're actually quite fond of these rats. Me? Oh, well, I was really surprised by them, yeah. I've only ever seen the big ones that you see in the <laughs> London parks. It's like, and then you wouldn't let them near you. So you wouldn't let them near your child. Um, so, yeah, it was it, Sam educated me in, in the loveliness of, of a rat. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> Staying on this topic, Don from San Diego wants to know what's been one of the most challenging scenes with your animal co-stars, not counting humans, I assume. <laughs> well, I always have a really easy time because I have Loopy Jess and then Bailey, who's lovely, shy Bailey, who plays rock. And now I've got Dash, who's also gorgeous. So I have a very easy time. Yeah, they sometimes go for a swim in the river, but I just really drink dog, tea yeah. while they have their swim. Yeah. And it, <laughs> so it's, it's that, like not that scene that we did in season one, Anna, when I was yeah. in the office and there was the mix-up of the cats. It was the, the first or second episode. First, first day, yeah. Almost. And every yeah. time you came around, you had to carry two cats. Every time you came around the corner, it was like the big reveal of where the cats would be. Yeah. Well, Sam's now going to learn head. how hard it is to yeah, carry two yeah. cats. Yes. Just, just on, that you on your back. And then the next time you appeared, you only had one cat and one had just left yeah. the building. <laughs> we agreed. It's always the cat. Apart from my 
apart from my well publicized troubles with um with cows which continue in series three um i have to big up mark and ben atkinson's horses mm. uh, they, they, i mean they are the oh, opposite they're astonishing it's like working with ferraris they're quite extraordinary yeah i mean i'm i'm no expert watching somebody like i rode a a, a horse called malik that ben atkinson uh if you don't know who Ben Atkinson is, look him up. Watch him work with Liberty Horses. It's if there is a horse whisperer in the world, it's Ben. Um, I worked with a horse that he'd had since it was five weeks old, and I was used to riding school horses where I really had to sometimes kick or at least squeeze a few times to go into a trot. And I remember at one point pulling in my stomach muscles on Malik, and he went, "Oh, we're trotting," and went away. And I thought, this is what they write about. This is this wordless communication that you can have with a, a beautifully trained horse. It makes you feel mu like a much better rider, but actually it's not you. It's just a fantastic horse. Uh, we have a question here that's a bit of a deep cut, but I, I, I'm very curious. Mary Jean from Harrisburg wants to know, there's a scene when Mrs. Pumphrey says she's thinking about planting celery and Tristan says, don't do that. I can't stand celery. Was this a sly reference to Callum's predecessor in the role, Peter Davison, who always wore a stalk of celery on his lapel as the fifth Doctor Who? Whoa. 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 <laughs> I know, right? Yes, <laughs> it was. <laughs> I wish that was the case. My suggestion. <laughs> wow. What? Is your mind kind of blown? Because that kind yes. of... Yes. <laughs> well, that's amazing. <laughs> Amazing knowledge! Wow. I don't know if the writer's got a predilection for celery or not, but um, I, I think that's rather brilliant that you've come up with that. I don't think that was the intention, but I love the thought of it. Knowing that now, Callum, would you go back and do the line differently? <laughs> oh yeah, I'd give it. I'd give it so much. Yeah. <laughs> I'd overact it to death. Yeah. I'd like uh, wink to the camera. To camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> If you could have, have worn some celery, couldn't you? Yeah. We have a question from Cheryl from Nashville. She wants to know what you all like most and least about your character. Um, and let's start with Rachel. Oh, oh. Um, what do I like the most about her? Her wardrobe's pretty good. Um, but I also, I like, um, I like her integrity. She does the right thing all the time. I really like that. What do I like least about? Um, I, uh, she takes a lot on, spins too many plates, probably sometimes compromises herself, I guess. Um, so I would say that, but that's really difficult. To, yeah. I like her, so that's hard. <laughs> Nicholas, for you? Uh, yeah, difficult. I, I, I really <clears throat> like pa how patient uh, James is um, and he has so much compassion, but at the same time, he has a backbone. You know, he's willing to stand up uh, for himself and especially for the animals, as we saw episode three of season one um, with regarding the horse. Um, so I really like that about him. Um, what do I not, uh, it's, not, it's not something I dislike, but he, he does need the occasional push from the likes of Tristan, Helen. Um, and sometimes I read the script and I'm like, come on, James. <laughs> <laughs> Get stuck in that. Uh, so <laughs> but it's, it's not something I dislike. It's, uh, yeah. So. Samuel, for you? I, I There's that rule about acting uh, of look for the opposite. I've always liked the fact that um, Siegfried, who has such a, sh a short temper sometimes, can be very patient with animals. Mm -hmm. So I like, I like his kindness and love, particularly towards horses. Um, I, I find his um, disapproval of things very frustrating sometimes. He gets grumpy. Um, and that that's hard because um, he also wants to be modern and 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 um, approving of things, but he's so controlling. It's a fascinatingly layered um, character, at least on paper. <laughs> By the way, I heard that the, the your animal co-star in episode three is like a really accomplished actor. That the the horse has appeared in Poldark and Victoria. Were you intimidated by? What, more experienced actors than me? No, I yeah, try not apparently. to be. I've had long, 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 long experience of, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're so well trained. You have to not say action around them because they start to move. So the first say, uh, so here we go in the rehearsal. Otherwise the horse just is off. <laughs> and Anna, for you, your favorite and least favorite thing about Mrs. Hall? Oh gosh, uh, Mrs. Hall's warm heart and her sense of fun. 
um, uh, I think uh, she's love for everybody and a dish for everybody at her table. Um, gosh, I I don't know. If there's anything I dislike about her particularly? I, her tights and the skirts. <laughs> I don't particularly <laughs> like those. Personally, <laughs> but <laughs> no, aprons are good. <laughs> Um, clothes with a bit of give to them would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Stiff clothes in the thirties. <laughs> Callum, for you. Um, I like how Tristan is just so optimistic. You know, he, he won't won't let anything get him down for too long. He'll always dust himself off and and crack on. I think that's a really good quality that Tristan has. Um, in terms of dislike, probably. Probably, probably the amount that Tristan eats, just because it makes for really, it, it makes for really tough viewing for me afterwards, watching myself look like that much of a pig on screen. Um, I mean, it all checks out. Tristan's that is exactly what he feels about food, but watching it is tough. <laughs> the food looks so good. Who can blame you? That's the problem. It's so good. It's really, good. It really is. Continuity uh, is completely screwed because we just keep the <laughs> sequence because because it's so nice. <laughs> Normally you sort of eat round the plate on set because you find the smallest bit you can eat, but on this one, we're more than happy to tuck in. <laughs> uh, forgive me if I mispronounce anyone's name, by the way. Um, I believe it's Anarchy from Sperryville, uh, Virginia, wants to know, is there a practical joker on set? And if so, what are some of the jokes? And the animals don't count. Oh God, I was about to say Derek as well. <laughs> Nick and I, Nick and I have a recurring gag uh, where he um, he brings up a prop, and and in a sort of Agatha Christie style uh, detective voice says, "Perhaps this will refresh your memory." <laughs> <laughs> and then I do it to him, and and the longer and more obscene the prop, the better the gag. <laughs> <laughs> that bears no remembrance to anything. <laughs> no, no, nothing at all. <laughs> This comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Anyone else, or is it is it ever hard not to break during scenes? There are some very funny moments. I th I'd be that person who'd be afraid of ruining the take. <laughs> uh, if Anna goes, then I, yeah. then I can. Yes, yeah, so I think if Anna goes, we're never we're, go. We're, we're, we're I'm gone. so pro. I would never go, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I think it takes a lot for. I think it takes a lot to set Anna off. But once she's yeah. gone, you yeah. may as well just send we'll her home. <laughs> Yeah. For Anna, I think the, the it's not coming back. Right? <laughs> in her feet. It like starts in her feet and reverberates all the way up her body until it actually comes out. <laughs> That's why it's, <laughs> it's, it's I'm learning much. something here. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a question from Isabel from Texas. Wants to know what do you all like to do in between filming scenes? Have a cup of tea. Yeah. Eat some of the delicious snacks that they make for us back. Yeah. not backstage behind the scenes sounds like the food on set is really I mean you got food and animals this is a dream job mm. Mm. Yeah. and there's a gorgeous yeah. little dog on the costume truck like, to go I was and just about to yeah. say uh, Rudy yeah. Yeah. Rudy's really oh. big now <laughs> is he big? <laughs> yes yeah, there's always an animal to go and hang out with Oh, great. Yeah. if you're ever looking for Callum <laughs> yeah. you know, between things, you can't find him. Won't be in his trailer. Actor, won't be in the green the room. You'll sort of unpick a number of dogs, and he'll be somewhere underneath them, just being <laughs> licked. <laughs> Always. That is true. That's my. There, there are a lot of animals that belong to the crew as well. So there's kind of the onset acting animals, and then there's a lot of people bring just surrounded by dogs and mm -hmm. ducks and chickens and all sorts. The best. They get to bring their right in there. Yes, every day is bring a pet to work day. Is, you, know, you, know, you're not, you know you're going to get a, a, a nice reception on set. In fact, yeah. that scene in episode one of the wedding where um, Tristan wakes up on the sofa with Jess licking his face was the, when we were shooting that. What did they put on your face, Cal? At the end of it, you said, oh, Melissa, it's like the best ever day cheese. at work. Cheese paste, yeah. I put, they put a load of cheese paste on my cheek. I was like, put more on, put more on. <laughs> that was the dedication that day. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Not everyone yeah. would have been yeah, that your ideal scene, get enough it? of it. It was it's literally my dog. ideal scene. Yeah. Get licked, <laughs> licked away by a dog, a lovely dog. Yeah, perfect. It's so good that I, I'm a married woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it, yeah. I mean, I was surprised to learn from the animal trainer, Jill Clark, that the dogs are really her dog's that she trained yeah. also her pets. So like Derek is a pet. 
Mm. Derek plays Tricky Woo. Yes. Well, if Derek was an independent <laughs> actor, we couldn't afford him. So it's a good, <laughs> it's a good job he is a, a pet, really. Yeah. Uh, she does have like a kitchen full of about 15 dogs or something. Wow. Wow. Um, a lot of vacuuming. <laughs> We have a question from Minnie from Seattle. This is actually for the producers. Um, we saw season three takes a different approach to storytelling. Siegfried has his flashback. Mrs. Hall took a trip outside to see her son. Um, will we be seeing more of that in the future? I think this is a, a coy way of asking what's going to happen in season four. <laughs> Can't tell you what's going to happen in season four. I think it's always about serving the story. We felt that the, you know, the show was sort of, the show and the format were really strong enough um, that we could do something different. It's always serving the story. So that that story of um, uh, telling some of Siegfried's narrative and sort of what happens to him, it, it felt really natural that we actually showed it um, on screen. So that that's where that came from. And then actually, the Edward and Mrs. Hall story, as I think Sam alluded to earlier, Ben Vanson actually wrote the Edward and Mrs. Hall reunion in the Christmas episode of series two. And there just wasn't space to tell it properly. Um, so he took it out and we thought we'd save it. And as this, as the script was developed for um, episode five of this season, it just became apparent that it was the lead story. And actually it's unusual because it's the only A story, the sort of lead story we've ever told in the show that doesn't contain an animal. But it felt like that story had been really earned and we just wanted to have space and time for them to have what was a very long, important conversation. So it was just led by the needs of the story. I love that. Um, and finally, we have a question from Heather from Lou Ridge, Virginia, wants to know from the actors, when were you first introduced to All Creatures Great and Small? Was it the James Harriet books when you were younger or the early PBS series? She just wants to add, thank you for bringing such a sweet and joy and peace to our Sunday nights here in Virginia. No, thank you. Oh, what a pleasure. Uh, let's start with Samuel. When were you? Did you uh, Lou books when I was a child. Uh, in fact, thanks to the success they'd had in America. They, really? they Well, because they, they weren't hugely popular when they were first published in Britain. And they did very, very well in the 70s as a combined volume. And that's what provoked the film, the first uh, television film, which is why there was a 1970s series, which is probably why there was uh, a 2020s one. So we have America to thank for the success of the stories. But yeah, I grew up with them in the loo because all the because all the um, chapters are short enough to read during an average visit to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and Anna, for you? Um, I remember the theme tune from childhood, but but really, um, Ben Banston introduced me properly. Um, a meeting for Mrs. Hall. I didn't know who she was and, and got stuck in and then started reading them and absolutely loved them so so thanks to this series really I, I know more than a wonderful tune. <laughs> Rachel? Um, yeah similar really I'd read one book when I was younger so I was kind of roughly familiar with the world but um but this has been my yeah this has immersed me in it again and I reread the books and they were wonderful but yeah. Callum for you? Uh, yeah, same. This, yeah, getting getting the getting the audition through was um, and reading the scripts, and then after getting it, uh, going and reading the books and absolutely loving them. Yeah, yeah. And Nicholas, yeah, likewise. Um, this this job, and then subsequently, you know, reading the books during prep and things, and now I've done the audio books as well. So I know the books inside out, upside down, back to front page to page <laughs> that's actually really useful yeah, for the rest of the cast time. now so you know we, we we all have i think read the ones that, that that we've adapted so far and some of the others but if we want really close knowledge of the books we have to go to nick because he's done them on audio books so he knows them better I, than we do and mm -hmm. I, make I love that susanna melissa what about for you how did you first become acquainted with this story well I know of it from the series, not the original books, but of course, when we decided we were going to do this, I went and read one of the books um, just to get a feel for it. And um, so that's how I was introduced really through the PBS series. Well, my parents and Nora actually used to live up in the Dales. It is one of the most beautiful places if, if you'd get a chance to go. Um, 
and they they had some of the books so I'd read the first book years ago and watched some of the series as a child um and loved it and then for this show read the rest of them and they really are I mean that that's the that's the thing we tried to do was to and what Ben's writing so brilliantly does is capture the spirit and the feeling of the book so they do make you laugh and make you cry and make you feel better and they're so enjoyable and that's the that's what we tried to capture as the experience for the audience yeah one of the things that Ben has said is that the books have a lot of scenes with cows and that one of the things he's had to do is pull different stories about different animals further along in the book so that he could vary having cows and sheep and other kind of animals lots of cows in the book yeah we have sometimes changed a story to another animal but always phoning Jim White and asking him because he's a he's also a, a vet retired now but worked with his dad so we have to sort of run it past Jim and say could this be a pig or a horse or or something or a rat it all be like cows. A rat right. yeah. <laughs> actual Samuel what why did you want rats so badly um well, I thought it. I thought they would make a very good uh, story for somebody to to bring them in. They were rare as pets in the nineteen thirties, but not impossible. Uh, and I thought that's what would happen because I can handle a rat and I can clip its nails. And I thought one well, might be. I've always been fans of them. But then they gave me one that I'd won in a <laughs> won in a drinking contest, and so now it's a permanent member of the cast. I mean, I just think they. Uh, we have a weird sort of hierarchy of small rodents in in Britain that hamsters and guinea pigs. Uh, you know, are above rats, and I'm going to annoy a lot of people now by saying that I don't think they deserve to be. I've never been bitten by one. Uh, mine learnt their names and would come when they were called. Um, I've had five, and um, they don't live very long. That's the only thing about them, but otherwise they're the perfect pets. And do you clip the nails of the rats on the show? Yeah. Oh, in this, not so far, but I will okay. do if you ask me to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank you all for such a joyous, wonderful series. Thank you all so, so much for being here. Thanks, Janelle. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for inviting thank us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to the audience question. for all your support and for watching the show. Yeah, yeah.